Okay. Hi, everybody. Today is Wednesday, October 16th, 2024. My name is Joy, and I'm a recovered Al-Anon, and uh, I'll be leading this meeting. We want to welcome everyone to our Al-Anon Big Book Recovery Meeting. This is a step speaker meeting that meets every Wednesday night at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time or 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We will study the 12 steps by using the precise instructions out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous as they relate to us as Al-Anons. Let's get our meeting started. Uh, this is the original AA preamble written by the AA Grapevine uh, describing the fellowship in 1940. We study the preamble with an open mind and open heart to consider how it applies to Al-Anon. This helps us to stay focused on the message of recovery the pioneers intended while observing the traditions and actions. Through the actions taken based on the instructions of the basic text, we comprehend what the pioneers meant when they described the membership of AA, which is that they worked a program of recovery and they no longer drank. And in our case, we no longer obsess over the alcoholic. Through continuous action and study of these principles, the understanding of the value of the original preamble reveals itself. We ask for your humble consideration of our sincere admiration of the pioneers of Alcoholics Anonymous. The simple hope is that we of Al-Anon will grow into the same clarity and unity that birthed the original 12-step fellowship, because without them, after all, none of us would be here. Okay, I'm going to read the, I'm going to go ahead and read the original AA preamble. We are gathered here because we are faced with the fact that we are powerless over alcohol and unable to do anything about it without the help of a power greater than ourselves. We feel that each person's religious views, if any, are his own affair. The simple purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is to show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than ourselves, regardless of what our individual conception of that power may be. In order to form a habit of depending and referring all we do to that power, we must first apply ourselves with some diligence. By often repeating these acts, they become habitual, and the help rendered becomes natural to us. We have come to know that as alcoholics, we suffer from a serious disease for which medicine has no cure. Our condition may be the result of an allergy, which makes us different from other people. It has never been permanently cured by any treatment with which we are familiar. The only relief we have to offer is absolute abstinence, the second meaning of AA. Making sure I'm not muted. There are no dues or fees. The only requirement for membership is, is a desire to stop drinking. Each member squares his debt by helping others to recover. An Alcoholics Anonymous member is an alcoholic who, through the application of and adherence to the AA program, has forsworn the use of any and all alcoholic beverages in any form. The moment he takes so much as one drop of beer, wine, spirits, or any other liquid containing alcohol, he automatically loses all status as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA is not interested in sobering up drunks who are not sincere in their desire to stay sober for all time. Not being reformers, we offer our experience only to those who want it. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and on which we can join in harmonious action. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our program. Those who do not recover are people who will not or simply cannot give themselves the simple program. Now, you may like our program or you may not, but the simple fact remains that it works and we believe is our only chance to recover. There is a vast amount of fun uh, included in the AA fellowship. Some people might be shocked at our seeming worldliness and levity, but just underneath there lies a deadly earnestness and a full realization that we must put first things first. And with each of us, the first thing is the solution to our alcoholic problem. To drink is to die. Faith must work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. In order to set our tone for this meeting, I ask that we bow our heads in a few moments of silent prayer and meditation, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will not mine be done. 
I wish to remind you that whatever is said at this meeting expresses our own individual opinion as of today and of, as of up to this moment. We do not speak for AA as a whole, and you are free to agree or disagree as you see fit. In fact, it is suggested that you pay no attention to anything which might not be reconciled with what is in the AA Big Book. If you don't have a big book, it is time you bought one. Read it, study it, live with it, follow the directions in it, and learn what it means to be an AA. And that's the end of the preamble. A sponsor is anyone who has had a psychic change as a result of working the steps and has a willingness to work with others. For those looking for a sponsor to guide them through the steps, please stay tuned and have your, tuned and have your pens ready to record phone numbers immediately after the meeting. Each al group ought to be a spiritual entity having but one primary purpose, that of carrying the message to the al who still suffers. This is our primary spiritual aim. Our job as a group is to provide people with a place to learn about and work the steps. It has been our experience that working the steps consistently provides us with a better state in our life. We consider all else to be an outside issue. This includes personal problems. The proper venue for sharing such problems is with a sponsor. This is, after all, where real recovery takes place, is marking the steps with a sponsor. We are just so glad we are all here, and we are all here because we are not all there. And there will be a period of fellowship after the meeting if you have questions, if you need a sponsor, if you need to check in or get current, or if you want to discuss other literature, please stick around for the fellowship. That would be a better time for these subjects. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um... Last week, we uh, I finished up chapter or chapter. Um, I finished up step six. Um, so today, I'd like to cover steps uh, seven, eight, and nine. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get into that. Before I do, just in case there's anybody new on the line, just to kind of go back and, and refresh um, step one a little bit and um to just kind of cover what we we've taught we talked about earlier in the series uh if we look at step one i mean all the steps are listed on page 59 in the in the big book um step one says uh we were powerless over alcohol um and our lives have become unmanageable so we break we break step one down into two parts and, and they're referencing um they talk about way back um in the it's either the preface of the forward of the first edition it talks about um how this is a problem of mind and body and so two part illness and we kind of can can break that down into um two parts for for step one um when we talk about we're powerless over alcohol and as alanons we have the same step one as the alcoholic and so what we're doing here is we're learning we're learning about the alcoholic um, through the study of the big book we're learning how we can apply the principles on the family members um, to this problem that we have where um, you know we we want to control and manipulate and obsess over the alcoholic and so when step one talks about we're powerless over alcohol is alan on we're powerless over the alcoholic who's powerless over alcohol. And for an alcoholic, um, powerless over alcohol comes down to the body. And um, Dr. Stilkworth talked about in the doctor's opinion of the allergy and there's a loss of control that happens and the phenomenon of craving and how, um, you know, when he was treating a lot of people in Towns Hospital that, um there were these alcohol there were these these people that he referred to as chronic that they were just doing the in and out stuff you know in and out in and out in and out but there were hard drinkers too he treated a lot of hard drinkers he said about one out of one out of ten of the hard drinkers um were actually chronic alcoholics and because a hard drinker can kind of have some of the <clears throat> earmarks of a chronic but given sufficient reason they can stop but but they don't do the the bouncing in and out stuff um that a chronic alcoholic will do so powerless over the body it you know again comes down to control so once they take that first drink there's a loss of control that happens 
Now, in Al-Anon, a family member doesn't, the body component is not the same, and um, it's kind of less, I don't want to say less important, but what what's really important for, that, for a family member is that um, as an alcoholic gets sicker and sicker in their disease, the family tends to suffer through the same, um, the, mental, the mental traits are very similar for the family. And so the loss of control, they're powerless over alcohol. We're powerless over our thinking, too, in that um, once we start trying to obsess and control them, it's kind of like a runaway train with our thoughts. But more importantly, the second part of step one, the unmanageability comes down to the mind, uh, referencing the mind as um, it does, there's no choice anymore and that the alcoholic doesn't have a choice if they're going to pick up that first drink. And me as a family member, I don't have a choice if I'm um, going to obsess over them or not. You know, it doesn't matter how bad I tell myself I'm not going to, I still will. And um, it's important if you're new here, because not all family members are, are chronic. You know, we think about chronic, that means it's with us forever, versus acute where, you know, it's something we might treat um, mildly or maybe, some, you know, maybe therapy works for somebody and, you know, they can kind of do a round of therapy or something and they're fine. They don't, they don't need to continue. Now, a family member that's chronic is going to um, always go back to obsessing, controlling, and manipulating the alcoholic. And so there's no choice anymore. They, they they talk on page 44 in that first paragraph. They really break it down very simple, and that's part of the beauty of this program is the simplicity and um, how is over time, you know, humans tend to make things complicated. But one of, you know, one of the foundational ideas behind these principles is how simple they are and keeping it simple. And... So for a family member, if you read that top paragraph on 44, it talks about, you know, once you start obsessing over the alcoholic, you know, basically, can you just, can you just stop? Is it hard to stop? Can you control it? And, uh, can you ever quit? It says, can you ever quit entirely? So for, for me, um, I can't ever quit entirely. So I always go back to obsessing, even though I say I'm not going to, so I have a broken mind. And that's really supposed to be gone through with a sponsor, and it talks about um, further in the book, once you recover, how um, it's our job as sponsors to qualify somebody and make sure that they belong here and make sure that they need a spiritual experience to remove the obsession because there's um, quite a few people that end up in our fellowship any fellowship that um, might look like, you know, a hard drinker. You know, for the Al-Anon, I don't know what you would say that is. But um, given sufficient reason, they can stop. Giving a doctor telling them to stop, family members saying, you know, just leave this person alone, they can stick to that resolve. And so the qualification is very important. And it, and it was it was important to our founders, uh, but it kind of has become a lost art for some reason um, over the years. But it is it is important that we know who we're working with. So anyway, that's like just a brief little recap of step one. In case you're new, um, in case you needed to know, you know, do I belong here or not? So um, okay. So I'm going to get into the book. So we left off at step seven. And let me pull this up. If I can find it. Okay. Here we go. So again, last week um, talked about inventory, talked about um, giving that inventory. Um, going over that inventory with a sponsor in step five, seeing some certain truths about ourselves in step five, and that um, a lot of these resentments that we have and the harm that we've done to people and the fear we have is 
maybe a lot to do with our selfishness. And they talk, they talk previously back in step three, starting around page 60, the whole language of the book starts to change around page 60 and that they stop talking about alcoholism and they start talking about selfishness. And this is where in step four, um, we're going to start dealing with this selfishness. And our, and our sponsor really helps us see it in a fifth step. And then in step six, which is this top paragraph on page 76, we're going to, 76, we're going to be willing to let God work on this for us. Um, that we've seen these truths and we're basically recommitting to the program through six and seven and that we're saying, okay, God, um, I see these truths about myself. I'm in. I'm in whether the alcoholic recovers or the alcoholic doesn't recover. So in step seven, in step six, we're willing to let God um, remove these things that are objectionable is how they word it in, on page 76. And then that second paragraph on 76, we're going to actually ask God to remove um, to remove these things with a seven-step prayer. So it says, uh, when ready, we say something like this, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. And then we have then completed step, step seven. And so the seventh step prayer is actually the one of the is the only original AA prayer that's in this book. All the other prayers, um, well, if you think about the bigger prayers like the third step prayer, the resentment prayer. Um, all, you know, they have lots of other little prayers. Um, every, for every step they get, they give us a prayer. And, um, the, they're, they're all rooted, um, kind of back into, into the, the religious roots of, uh, you know, that there was a religious influence on Alcoholics Anonymous that came through the Oxford group. But the seven step prayer is actually an original AA prayer. Um, it's a, it's a really neat prayer. And, Again, we're recommitting here, and it says if you, it says the word now. You know, it says it says the word now a couple different times throughout this prayer. So it's like in, in the beginning, we think back to the third step prayer. We're making a decision to let God drive the ship, and now it's like okay, now, now I'm that I've seen all these truths in a fifth step. And now I'm 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 still here. I'm still in. I'm still going to move forward with the steps. I'm still going to listen to my sponsor. I'm still going to help other family members. And very simple. If you look at, you know, they're they're covering between um, these two pages, 76 and 77. They're going to cover four steps. So again, going back to the simplicity of the program and how it was very it was very important. You know, our job as sponsors is to stop the bleeding. Because the more we just kind of stay in a step and kind of like hang out there, um, the more it, we have to get tapped into this power. And um, step six and seven are laid out very simple in the book. And, and the, re the reason for that is we need to get on our way uh, into this amends process here. We need to get on our way into um, – they reference it as maintenance, but it's not really maintenance. Uh, through step 10, we're, we're going to be growing towards this power. We're going to be connecting with this power through step 11. We're going to be helping um, other family members through step 12. And we need we need to get on our way there. And they're now going to give us, they're going to jump in, talk, referencing step 8 here, um, third paragraph on page 76. It says, now we, now we need more action without which we find that faith without works is dead. They, they meant, this is mentioned a couple different times in the book, uh, faith without works is dead. It's not enough to just believe. There has to be action followed up by the faith. It says, let's, let's, look, let's look at steps eight and nine. We have a list of all persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. So they're very specific, and this is why we don't just like burn our inventories after we write them is because we need our inventory because it's going to help us make the list. And we don't get to pick and choose who goes on the list. And that's why, you know, it's not written in the book this way, but there was a way my sponsor had me do this list to make it maybe a little less painful <laughs> looking. 
and she had me break my list up into uh, columns. There were four columns. There was the, the now column, which those are the people, if I'm looking over my inventory, I'm looking at all these people um, that I was resentful at, that I wronged, and there's some of these people that I'm like, you know what, I could go do an amends right now. Like, I see this very clearly. I could go do an amends right now if I had to. Um, the later column was kind of for the people I knew I was going to have to make an amends to, but I really wasn't wild about the idea. And the maybe column are, you know, they do talk about in, in step nine as it's written that we're not going to do an amends if it causes harm. There's going to be a list of people there that I'm not sure if I owe, if I should make an amends to them um, because I don't know. Maybe it will cause harm. Maybe it won't. And then the never column are the pre, the people I'm not, I'm like you know these are the people I'm not touching with a ten foot pole. Like I ain't doing it. Um, and so what happens is if I can start on some of these easier amends then I become a little bit willing to do that next column, you know. And by the end, but you know, by the time I start doing some of this stuff, um, for me personally, you know, I've tackled people out of that never column. And that was, that was because the more that I started doing my amends, the more I started to become free and tapped into the power, and the more I became willing to look at this, this uh, my wrong, and it became clear that even some of the people in the, the column where I thought I could never make an amends to them, like it wasn't happening, um, I was able to make that amends. Um, so this list we have, again, it comes from the inventory. Everybody from the inventory goes onto the list. We don't get to pick and choose who goes onto the list. We don't get to say, oh, I feel comfortable doing it to this person. I'm putting this person on the list. Um, that's why they have that never column. If it's a person I think I'm ne I don't need to make an amend to, whatever, I'm going to stick them in that, in that column. And um, it goes on to say we, we made this list when we took inventory. So they tell us the instruction is that, the list comes from the inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. That's the fourth step. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of the effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. So they give us a prayer right here for step eight in that there's going to be some of these amends that maybe I'm still having a hard time seeing my wrong. Or maybe I know that I'm wrong, but I am just not, I, I can't forgive this person. So we're, they tell us we're going to ask God to help us be willing. We need to be willing. Um, and it, then they remind us, remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. So they're reminding us what we agreed to in that in that bar in that deal that we made in step three with God that we were gonna um let God drive the ship and God was, you know, gonna gonna take over life for us and we were gonna, you know, go through with the steps and listen to our sponsor and help people. Um that's the deal we entered into here. So this is not and in a men's take courage. This isn't for we're not saying that, oh, this is the easiest process ever. This is not easy. It, it does take a lot of courage to do this stuff. They do tell us, um, so now getting into step nine, and Bill lays out the amends through this chapter um, really well. He just he gives us um, basically any scenario we're ever going to come across with an amends. He really lays it out um, really well saying, you know, this is going to happen, and if this doesn't, you know, this is going to happen, or this could happen, or this type of amends. And so there, and me personally, I really haven't ever run into an amends, whether for myself or with um, a protege, where it wasn't really, it wasn't covered here. So, so Bill is very thorough 
about the amend, and that's because um, if we don't do this right, we can cause more harm. So it's important it's done right. It's important that we work closely with a sponsor, that we don't run out and start giving amends to people. So where do I want to start here? So there's conditions that need to be met to make to make an amend. And let me find these. It says at the bottom of page in that very top paragraph on 77, it says, um, but our man is sure to be impressed with a sincere desire to set right the wrong. So that's a condition that needs to be met when I go into an amends. I need to have a sincere desire to right the wrong. And then they go into some other conditions here. Um, it says we need to go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit. And then they get into um, on the top page 70, 78, it says uh, his faults are not discussed. We stick to our own. If our manner is calm, frank, and open, we will be gratified with the results. So uh, there are conditions that need to be met. You know, if we haven't forgiven this person, then we don't make the amends. And, you know, like it talked about in step eight, we're going to keep praying for the willingness to do that amends. Um, let me see where I want to go. It says on middle of 77, we don't use this as an excuse for shying away from the subject of God when it will serve any good purpose. We are willing to announce our convictions with tact and common sense. And, and they kind of reference something similar in the next paragraph. It says, under no condition do we criticize um, such a person or argue. Simply we tell him that we will never get over our drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past. Now, when we go into an amends, we do want to be careful not to just say, oh, I'm an Al-Anon and I have to make this amends. Um, it's okay if maybe during how that how that amend is worded that if they ask us, you know, why are we doing this, blah, 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 we can tell them, you know, hey, I'm um, I'm a member of Al Anon now, I'm trying to clean up some wrongs. That's fine. Um but we're not gonna lead into an amend saying, Well, you know, I got religion and I need to do this. That, that it doesn't come off as sincere and people um People often ask as well, because the way that sometimes the amends as is laid out um, can be kind of dry. You know, we're not we're not going to um, we're going to memorize these amends, and um, it talks about direct amends in step nine, which means face you know face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And because I need to know that I've done my utmost, deep deep inside me, I need to know that I have done everything that I can to try to right this wrong. And when I'm, you know, writing a letter, if I'm doing it over the phone, um, I don't, I still might see that person and not know how they're going to, how they're going to take my amends. So um, there are um, situations where maybe those things are, you know, where maybe a letter is appropriate, maybe a phone call is appropriate, maybe, um, you know, a video call is appropriate, but they are very specific. We ha we need to do direct amends. Uh, it says wherever possible, not whenever possible. So we're going to try to make these amends directly. And I think I was kind of forgot what I was going to go back to, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go forward just where Bill starts getting into some of this stuff. <clears throat> uh, the first thing that he talks about, um, it's kind of interesting what, how, the way he lays out the amends is that he actually starts with talking about um, enemies. And enemies are some of, probably some of the most difficult amends to do, but they're actually some of the most freeing amends to do. And he says, um, first paragraph, page 78, 
Rarely do we fail to make satisfactory progress. Our former enemies sometimes praise what we are doing and, and wish us well, and occasionally they'll offer assistance. But it should not matter, however, if someone does throw us out of his office. We have made our demonstration, done our part. It's water over the dam. So amends might not always go the way that we think they do. And one of the worst things we can do uh, with an amends is go into it thinking that we're going to fix the relationship because that's not the goal of the amends. Uh, we're just trying to right the wrong. And usually if we go into an amends with, a motive that is not lined up, uh, you know, it, it's not really, a, it maybe has, there's some selfishness in that motive, then, and, and then, and we're disappointed after the amends, it means that our motive wasn't in the right place because we should be able to go in that, uh, into that amends with a clean motive, and no matter how it turns out, we should be satisfied with it. And if we're not, it means we probably didn't go into it with the right motive. And, okay, next thing they're going to talk about is restitution. So he starts talking about, he actually spends a lot of time talking about this. Um, page 78 says, most alcoholics owe money. Uh, it says we don't dodge our creditors. So he's going to spend um, actually the next few paragraphs into the next page on page 70 time talking about um, restitution and financial amends. Now, financial amends are tricky. Now, we're not going to just show up. Um, and it, as family members, I think sometimes it's easy for people to think, well, you know, the alcoholic is the one that's done all this harm. You know, we don't, we never did any of this stuff. Um, a lot of family members have done, um, you know, things where we, you know, we owe money, where we have stolen money, maybe um, somebody loaned us some money and we never paid it back. So if we go back and we look at a lot of this stuff, um, we'll see that we're not, um, we're not always the innocent, the innocent bunch, that we, we have a lot of, um, a lot of this, this uh, restitution stuff applies to us as well. Now, going into a financial amends, I'm not going to go into a financial amends uh, not prepared to pay the money back. You know, I'm not going to go to somebody and be like, you know, hey, I'm sorry, you know, it was wrong of me to um, not pay back that, that money that you loaned me. And But, yeah, that was really messed up and sorry and what can I do to make it right. We're – we're going to go into that amends prepared to start paying it back. And even if it's a small sum of money, it doesn't matter what it is, but we need to have a plan going into that amend saying, okay, hey, um, I have this wrong. I owe you this. I stole this money from you. I'm prepared to pay you this much, you know, over time, you know, once a month or whatever, whatever it is. But we need to be prepared to do that. We're not going to go into a financial amends uh, not prepared to pay the money back. So let me see what my time is doing. I'm doing a time. I've got like 20 minutes. Okay. They start getting into on page 76. Um, some of this stuff that can be a little complicated and, and likely can relate to um, our sex harms. It, ta it says, uh, usually, however, other people are involved. Therefore, we are not to be the hasty and foolish martyr who would ne needlessly sacrifice others to save himself from the alcoholic pit. Um, a man we know had remarried. Because of resentment and drinking, he had not paid alimony to his first wife. And they're still kind of covering restitution here. She was furious. She went to court and got an order for his arrest. He had commenced our way of life. And um, so we're talking about they're referencing, again, harm. So if me making an amends is going to harm other members of my family, then I have to consider is that, is that amends worth doing? Now, that's why we have a sponsor, because it would be easy for us to just say, hey, I don't want to do that amends. It's uncomfortable. 
um, I'm just not going to do it. You know, so that's that's why our sponsors are going to help help us keep our motives right. And um, forever, our, from this point forward, once we start practicing step nine, our motives are going to be constantly in question. And we're going to uh, keep them close to us, keep our sponsors close. Uh, hold on. Top of page 80, it says, before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we secure their consent. Uh, they're going to give us a, a step nine prayer. If we have obtained permission, have consulted with others, ask God to help, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. So for some of the amends that we make, um, we might have to get permission to make the amends. You know, a great example of this is maybe to a minor. If we need to make an amends to a minor, we might have to secure the consent of their parents before we make that amend. So there's a lot of things to think about here because it's very, very common that people just kind of turn, you know, they get turned loose in this amends process, and they can really mess things up. And... They're going to get into, he felt that he had done them wrong, he cannot possibly mind. This is a great part, this is a great part, because they're going to give this example of a story um, of this guy who really just, just threw his rival under the bus. This is page 80, and um, they have this paragraph on the middle of page 80 about this person really getting in their head about making this amends. It says, he felt that he had done a wrong he could not possibly make right. If he opened that old affair, he was afraid it would destroy the reputation of his partner, disgrace his family, and take away his means of livelihood. What right had he to involve those dependent upon him? How could he possibly make a public statement exonerating his rival? And so this is a similar thought process that we go through uh, when we're working on our amends. And it's very easy to drift back into self and to not trust God and to just really go inside ourselves over these things and make up, in our, you know, because we can make, make up um, all kinds of stories in our heads about how the amends is going to go and blah, blah, blah. And we should be able to see. Um, some things that we learned from doing a fifth step that fear happens when we're not trusting God and fear happens when I think I'm going to lose something that I have or I'm not going to get what I want. We're not talking about fear like snakes or spiders or whatever, but it's really easy for us to go inside ourselves. And it says after consulting with his wife and partner, he came to the conclusion that it was better to take those risks than to stand before his creator guilty of such ruinous slander. And so he consulted um, with his wife and his partner. That would have been his sponsor. And he he saw that he had to place the outcomes in God's hands or he would soon start drinking again. And um, so that's what we do, you know. And some of these amends that we're going to make might be a little complicated, and we're going to pray about them. And we're going to have discussion with uh, our sponsors. Um, maybe we need to get permission from somebody. But, you know, we see uh, at the end of the story, he, you know, all turned out well. And um, that went well. And so, But sometimes they don't go well. And that does happen. And sometimes we make an amends where um, it doesn't go the way we want. And all we can do, that's all, you know, all we can do is try our best. And maybe um, pray that in the future, maybe that person will um, accept our amends. So, okay. Now, they start getting into the domestic stuff, bottom of page 80. The chances are that we have domestic troubles. Perhaps we are mixed up with women in a fashion we wouldn't care to have advertised. We doubt if, in this respect, alcoholics are fundamentally much worse than other people, but drinking does complicate sex relations in the home, and this is very, very common um, within an alcoholic family. And so they start talking about giving some examples of infidelity and what's going to happen, how we're going to deal with that. 
and um, it's it's very complicated. This is complicated stuff, and because if we go, if there was infidelity, and we just go to this other person and say, you know, hey, I was, um, you know, I I was having, um, you know, an affair or whatever, then that could cause jealousy within that person, and they want to know, well, who's this other person, and blah, blah, you know, and it could cause a big old mess. <laughs> so uh, we have to pray about those situations because it might not be best to do that. Now, if this person already knows, um, if this, maybe the, the partner already knows that this was going on, that might be a different circumstance. It might call for a different situation. Um it says, whatever the situation, we usually have to do something about it. If we are sure our wife does not know, should we tell her? Not always, we think. If she knows in a general way that we have been wild, should we tell her in detail? Undoubtedly, we should admit our fault. She may insist on knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. We feel we ought to say to her that we have no right to involve another person. We are sorry for what we've done, God willing, and it should not be repeated. More than that, we cannot do. We have no right to go further. Though there may be just file exception, exceptions and though we wish to lay down no rule of any sort, we have often found this the best course to take. So um, when this tricky stuff comes up, we're going to, um, again, and that's such a common thing here, but, you know, if I'm repeating myself with step nine is that uh, this stuff, might take time and it might be, um, we might have to consult um, others to really help us um, come up with the best plan for some of these amends. Okay, I'm gonna go, it's still talking about amends. Now they start talking about, um, They've talked about restitution. They've talked about um, infidelity. They've talked about making amends. He's talked about making amends to the enemy to enemies. Finally, he's going to get into kind of making amends within the family. Now, if we think about step twelve, referencing, you know, we're going to practice these principles in all our affairs. You know, the home includes one of the places that we're going to practice these principles. Uh, it says, page 82, if we have no such complication, there is plenty we should do at home. Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say that the only thing he needs to do is to keep sober. So there's this thing that people like to say, which is that, um, you know, I'm just going to do a living amends, which is just saying, oh, all I have to do is keep sober, and then that's how I'm making an amends to somebody. And that's not really – and they kind of clarify here. Um, it says, certainly he must keep sober, for there will be no home if he doesn't, doesn't, but he is yet a long way from making good to the wife or parents, whom for years he has so shockingly treated. Um, so – we still have to make the amends. And a living amends is something that can happen actually after we give someone an amends, where uh, maybe someone tells us, you know, we ask them what we can do to make it right, and they say, oh, just keep working your program, keep doing what you're doing. And so that's a living amends. You know, the deal, the deal that they wanted, what they asked us to do was to keep doing the program. And so that's a living amends. That means I'm going to keep practicing the program. Um, <clears throat> again, still referencing the family on bottom of page 82. It says, the alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came up out of his cyclone cellar to find his home ruined to his wife. And to his wife, he remarks, don't see anything the matter here, Ma. In a grand, the wind stopped blowing. So again, saying a living amends is not enough. We actually have to go to these people and make a formal amends. Top of 83, um, 
more talking about family stuff. It says, yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful mumbling that we are sorry won't fill the bill at all. We ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it. So that basically says they're kind of used to us saying sorry. And what we're doing with our amends is not an apology tour because our family and our friends are used to us just saying sorry for everything. So um, an amends, I'm asking how, how can I make this right? And they're going to – they're going to be more impressed by a demonstration because um, they've just kind of heard everything from us and they're just kind of over it. So the demonstration is going to be more um, important. Here they give us another ninth step prayer for the families. It says, so we clean house with the family, asking each morning in meditation that our creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. So if we... So there's, and then they reference kind of some of these amends that we're not going to be able to make. Uh, it says, uh, page, bottom of page 83, it says, there may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would write them if we could. So some of these amends, um, maybe it's going to cause too much harm to give them. Maybe the person has passed away. And um, it says we're not going to get drift into self-pity over this stuff if, if all if all we can say is that we can honestly say that we would write them if we could that's all we need and we need to move forward from that um it says there may be a valid reason for postponement in some cases so they want us doing this pretty quickly we're not going to just sit on amends if there's a wrong um we need we need to make right we're going to go do it and that might mean driving that might mean like doing you know <laughs> doing a tour of the state we're living in uh they they want us to get this stuff done uh they say but we don't delay if it can be avoided we should be sensible tactful considerate and humble without being servile or scraping um and that's that's like a great example, um, you know, like for our kids. You know, sometimes we have to make um, even day-to-day -day amends to our kids, or uh, even a full amends. And they might, <laughs> maybe they come they uh, come back to us and say, you know, hey, I want tickets. I want to go do tickets to this concert and blah 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 blah. And they're just not letting it go. And it says we don't have to be servile or scraping. You know, we can say we tried we tried to make this thing right, and we don't have to, you know, cower to anybody. If, if what they're asking us, they want us to repay that debt, and they keep kind of holding it over our heads, it, they say that we don't do that. We don't have to do that stuff. So, um, again, we're going to talk to our sponsor about it. Uh, as God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. So now they're going to get into the Ninth Step Promises. And uh bottom of page 83, it says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. So these are some beautiful promises um, that are read quite often. But what we have to remember is we're not entitled to these promises just by showing up. It's just not by sitting in meetings. Uh, the ninth step promises come as a, a result of working the ninth step. And uh, it's actually a great way to use um, these promises as a barometer on our own spiritual health. So if we are in you know, if we maybe have been um in recovery a long time uh we can you know 
we could look at these promises and say, okay, I've done all this stuff. You know, am I still feeling these things? Uh, do I still know a new freedom and a new happiness? Do I still not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it? Um, do I see how my experience can benefit others? Um, what's a good one? Fear. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. That's a great one. So if I'm worrying all the time about finances and how we're going to get through, um, it's a good reminder, you know, have I been thorough with my ninth step? Is there any amends I'm sitting on? Because I'm starting to, because one of the ninth step promises is that this economic insecurity is going to leave me. So if it's coming back, um, have I fallen down on this amends process? It's just a good reminder. Uh, another thing that's kind of helpful to look at these promises. So if we if we think about the alcoholic and um, we want to know, you know, what was alcohol doing for this other person? You know, why is it that they drank? And, um, of course, if we study the previous pages, we know that um, alcohol wasn't really the problem. It was the solution. But we can kind of turn these promises around and get a lot of insight to what alcohol was doing for the alcoholic. Um, it says, uh, so if you think about it, uh, when an alcoholic uh, takes a drink of alcohol, he's going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. When an alcoholic is drinking, he will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. When an alcoholic is drinking, he will comprehend the word serenity and no peace. Um when an alcoholic is drinking, he will see how his experience can benefit others. That was kind of funny. Uh, when an alcoholic is drinking, that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. When an alcoholic is drinking, uh, he will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. When an alcoholic is drinking, self-seeking will slip away. When an alcoholic is drinking, their whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. When an alcoholic is drinking, fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us or leave them. When an alcoholic is drinking, they will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle them. So we find out, you know, that's basically what's happening here in the program is that, you know, for us, we used our obsession over the alcoholic, on the alcoholic, um, it was kind of filling this, it was providing ease and comfort for us. And so what happens is when we when we choose to work to follow these directions and instructions, it's the same thing. And that when I get tapped into this power, that um, all these things can come true for me too. But I'm, you know, it takes the same amount of energy to, um, for a plane to take off as it does to land. You know, so all that time that I spent obsessing over the alcoholic, that's how much time I'm going to spend on my program and helping other people because it was a lot of time. So um, it goes on to say, are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us sometimes quickly. So that's a spiritual experience. And then sometimes slowly, slowly that spiritual awakening and uh they they note the difference between those in the back of the book and Appendix 2. They talk about um, the difference between spiritual experience and spiritual awakening, one quickly, one slowly. So they will always materialize if we work for them. So, again, not just entitled to have these things by showing up in meetings. We have to actually do the work. So now they are going to start getting into Step 10. And... Um, We'll talk about step 10 next week, and uh, I'll, I'll cover steps 10 and 11 uh, next week. And um, we're meant to start working step 10 right away. So uh, they give us an instruction here on that bottom paragraph on 84. It says, this thought, this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along, and we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. So that means 
once I am willing to start this amends process, I'm going to start living and I'm going to start practicing step 10. That's what they're telling me. I don't have to wait to complete, like, all of my amends before I do this. They want us to get started um, taking daily inventory. And um, they give us a real specific way to do a 10th step here in this paragraph. But I'll get into that next week. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, let me get into the closing. Okay. Our seventh tradition says that every group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. This group does not have a payment structure in place and currently requires no overhead expenses. If you would like to fulfill Tradition 7, please direct contributions directly to the Al-Anon World Service Office by visiting al .org. For questions about this meeting or if you are looking for a sponsor, please send emails to al Recovery at gmail.com. Recordings can be accessed on YouTube by searching at al Step Speaker in the YouTube search box. If you are interested in other al meetings that follow the Big Book, please visit al BigBookSolutionGroup.org. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read from um, page 164 out of the Big Book. It says, our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But you obviously cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and for countless others. It's a great Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trode the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Now let's have a moment of silence for the al who still suffers. Um, followed by the Lord's Prayer or a prayer of your own choosing set in silence. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>